I'd like to welcome Florian uh, from JetBrains. Hey everyone, uh, thank you for coming here. Um, my name is Florian, I work for JetBrains as a developer advocate. Um, currently in, uh, doing mostly Golan, so our Go ID. Uh, but today I'm here to speak about uh, something else. Uh, I'm here to tell you how I build microservices in, uh, in Go in about 40 minutes or so, half an hour. Um, and like, I'm just gonna uh, jump right through uh, the code because this is gonna be a live coding session. And it's also the first time I do it, so let's see how it goes. Right, so uh, this is not a microservice, right? It's just the hello world basic application that you get and see, and as you can see, you can actually run it and it will print hello world at some point. Uh, just a note, my laptop is one of those ultra low voltage laptops that doesn't understand CPU or anything, so like Go compile takes a while, but it works. <laughs> um, so yeah. Skipping on to, to the actual code, like usually when you have the hello world, right, like uh, the first thing that you want to do here is like, oh, I don't want to, uh, to hard code this, right? So you'll, you'll see something like, oh, I just convert this to a constant and I call this, let's say, the message that I want to, to have, right? So uh, now I have that. Okay, so this is still working, compiling, and so on. So let's transform this into an actual microservice, something that uses, I don't know, let's say net HTTP, which we've learned uh, recently. So um, first thing, you would need a uh, mux in, in Go, something that actually takes your requests and uh, routes them accordingly, right? So we can say, oh, I want a new uh, mux, right? And now I want to actually use it. So. It's gonna be something like that, like a variable, right? And then I want to say something like, I want to handle func to actually handle the requests. And for this example, we'll just use something like, I want to handle the requests to the homepage. And I want to have, uh, let's say, the uh, classic interface to, like the, the classic function to handle this. Let's move this to the internal. And instead of like writing the uh, hello world, we'll just write the message as we normally do, right? And now this one needs still a, a bit of work because we need to do HTTP listen and serve, right? So we need to give it an address and we need to give it an address on 8080, let's say, on all addresses on my machine and I need to give it the max. And now, like, this is the basic hello world when it comes to HTTP servers. Um, if I run this, it's gonna work. Uh, there's nothing printed on, on the screen anymore, but if I go here, and uh, if I do run, I can see, uh, well, if the, yeah. So I can see hello world written by HTTP, and I see the, the, the headers that the request uh, generated, right? So, so far so good. Uh, let's make this a bit more uh, useful. And I'm, uh, one trick that I picked up while writing Go is that uh, it's always um, a bit faster for you to provide certain information about your response rather than not. So this is sort of like a micro-optimization if you want, but it's a good one. So let's say we do the right header because we know it's gonna be a status okay, right? And we also do something like, um, we want to give it a hint about the content type. The content type detection in Go takes quite a while uh, if you don't provide it, especially on like bigger responses, because it needs to detect like, okay, are you writing a JSON stream or are you writing a, an HTML page or XML or whatever. So in this case, um, sorry, uh, HTTP header where? I forgot my uh, shortcut <laughs> for this one. I have templates. Uh, where's my HTTP header? No, sorry, this one is later. Um, content type. Okay, so we can provide the content type. And like I said, this one usually speeds up your request. Um, and you'll see it if you benchmark it on my machine where it took 36 milliseconds to actually write hello world. It's not gonna be that obvious, but we can try. So we compiled and we, let's say we run this again. Sorry, uh, my 
laptop is not meant to, to do like that. So it, you can see some, some difference. It's 21 milliseconds now, right? Um, right, okay, so next. Uh, this is not really a microservice, and there are some things that we are not doing here. So for example, uh, how many of you uh, know that a listen and serve returns an error? Okay. So you should handle that error in case you, you don't know about it, mainly because you can, um, you can have cases where, for example, your uh, port is blocked by another application, and if you don't handle that, then your application will be like, oh, I can't start and like, just crash, but you won't know why. Like, your application can be perfect, like 100% coverage, 100% tests working, it just doesn't start, right? So uh, let's say we, w we don't want to do that, and let, uh, let's log this as a fatal error, and let's say something like, I don't know, uh, server failed to start, right? And we can provide the error as well. Right. So now we handle errors, because that's what we do in Go. Okay, so the next step would be, let's transform this into like a more uh, resilient web server. Um, how many of you have, have seen the uh, blog, blog post from Cloudflare uh, about how to serve pages on the internet, especially when you're using TLS? Okay, one person. <laughs> I expected more, but it's good. Uh, so I'm not gonna write, like I have two predefined uh, configurations for this one because I, like, I just can't remember all, all of that. But um, it's gonna be in the final uh, repository and you can use it. Uh, this is the address where you can actually find the blog post. It's blog Cloudflare and it's called Exposing Go on the Internet. And if you go there, you can see all the options that I'm adopting here and like, it tells you how to set your ciphers, what's your minimum TLS configuration, and so on, to actually make it a secure web server. And um, the next step, so once I've done that, so now I have my TLS configuration to be able to serve HTTP, uh, HTTPS traffic. I want to also have a custom server, because the standard built-in uh, HTTP package does have a uh, already created server, which is the, uh, the one that's behind listen and serve, but you don't necessarily want that uh, all the time. And you don't want necessarily that one, uh, because you, uh, let's say, want to set a different timeout for reads or for writes. And those timeouts are by default quite large, I think 10 minutes. And I'm not sure if you want to have a timeout on a request, on an, on, on an inbound request for 10 minutes, because then someone can actually mess up with your server quite badly. So let's, uh, let's move the service here, right? Now we have the server, and we can change this to a SRV, and then SRV doesn't take any parameters. So we hardened our server already in a few lines of Go. Uh, more importantly, like if I if I look at these, these uh, couple of lines of these few lines of configuration can also be abstracted. So I can put these in a separate package that I can always use. Uh, so let's say like I move this into a, um, I don't know, a new server, right? So for now, this kind of works. It's it's in its own function and so on. Uh, one thing that I would like to do now is to add an environment variable here and read it because it's going to be easier for me to, to run it, for example, from, uh, from Go, uh, from a Docker container. And we'll jump to the container later on. And uh, let's just add some environment variables for now. And we'll jump into them in a second. So I already predefined these, right? And I have this address. Now, I would like to, uh, to pass that address uh, always to, to my builder function so that uh, I can change it just from the configuration and I don't have to like, carry where I do uh, the change from. And uh, server address, and this one is a string. Okay, so now that I have a server address here, this one uh, still needs something. So I said TLS and uh, HTTPS, right? But we use um, 
where's the configuration? So we use listen and serve, which means still HTTP. So let's convert this one to a listen and serve TLS. And this one accepts uh, the uh, certificate that you want to use. For the pur purpose of the demonstration, I'm actually using some self-signed certificates because, uh, yeah, there's, I'm, I'm on local host, and it's fine. Uh, and I'm going to read them from, from the disk rather than like fetch them from somewhere else, like a NetCD uh, storage or something similar. But yeah, that, that one is on you, depends on how you provision your infrastructure. Uh, and we can uh, do something like this. So we need the search file, and we need a key file as well. So now that I have those two in place, hopefully, if I've done everything correctly, uh, Okay, stop and run. This one still works, and let's change to, um, let's do our request on HTTPS this time around. Um, okay, and that's it, I'm on HTTPS now. You can see I've made the request to HTTPS localhost. I've uh, used the Etsy host uh, file to actually uh, map that host locally, and it works. So in just a few lines of Go code, uh, like what, less than 68, you can have a secure web server already in Go, and it's configurable to how you want it. I also said earlier that probably you want to, to, to use this as a uh, separate package. So let's just move this one to a uh, different package. Um, Unfortunately, the resolution doesn't seem to help me here. Okay, fair enough. We'll do this the manual way. Okay, so let's create a new package here called server. So you can reuse this uh, pretty much any time. And because we are in the server package, we can just call it new. There's no, there's no need for that. So now that I, I've done that change, right? Everything should be back to normal. And like, I can reuse that package now safely. Uh, if I want, I can test it, but like, like, there's not much to test there, right? It's just configuration. Uh, if you want to test if Go sets structure values correctly, <laughs> then yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's going to be helpful or not. Um, okay, and the other thing is uh, we still have this built-in function here, right, this closure uh, that we want to move. So first, let's move this somewhere else uh, outside. Uh, let's call it home handler, right? And yeah. This starts looking a bit more like a Go service. And I'm going to apologize for this, but I actually think it's going to be easier to exit the presentation mode for a second, because I really want to move this one into a different package. So in Go, the idea of uh, packages is that you want to structure your uh, code on functional units. And you can see blog posts from Peter Bergan, from um, uh, I know her uh, by, by the name JBD, or Raquel, if you, if you know her by the uh, Twitter handle. Um, there, uh, Bill Kennedy wrote uh, a couple of blog posts on how to structure and how to think about Go packages. And um, the idea is that you want your packages to express units of work, not necessarily um, type of work. So I don't necessarily want to have a package called um, Handlers. I want to have a package called Homepage. Um, I mean, it's a bit forced as an example, but you can think of a package named Checkout, right? Where where you have all the checkout logic, and that doesn't mean necessarily just the uh, handler, the HTTP handler that takes care of the request, but you can also have there the database uh, interaction part, or you can have the uh, template rendering part, so that everything is. Uh, encapsulated in a single package, and it's easier to see. And that's, that's what I want to, to do with this one. So uh, let's, let's move this one to, to a package called, um, I don't know, uh, homepage, right? And we'll move it to 
Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. I need to move the, uh, the message as well because we actually uh, depend on the message uh, constant and I don't care about that anymore to, to be in the main package. So now I have that package, right? And it's easier to, to group here everything that's related to the home page. However, uh, what I found useful when, uh, when I was working with, with microservices was that it's better not to, to have functions directly because you probably will, uh, as handlers, because you probably will have dependencies on other packages. So for example, you have a dependency on, the, on a database or on the logging package, and you want to somehow inject those functionalities in it. I could go and say something like, oh, I want to log here, uh, I don't know, let's say print line, I'm starting the server. Right, so I can do that, and then I can do something in, in the home handler which says, oh, I've received the request. Right, so now I use the log package in two places, but I don't have necessarily control on what happens with that logging uh, library. If I want to now, um, let's say, log to standard error instead of standard out, or if I want to use a, a different format for the logging, I need to be careful to either the package to be well written enough so that it can process that request from me as a user, or uh, I need to do the work twice, right? So I was saying earlier, I want to inject that dependency on, on the logging package. And the built-in logging uh, library has something called a, uh, can actually create a new logger. So you can say log.new, right? And you can choose where to write, for example. And I want to write to std out. I want to prefix, uh, let's say, uh, gophercon uk. And I want the, standard flags, STD flags, and I want the short file name because uh, you can actually get the file name of, uh, of the line that prints, that calls the uh, log function. So you can make your life easier debugging. And generally I found that in my code, uh, I can trace uh, quick enough uh, from where the log line came from by the file name. So I can do short um, log l uh, short file name, yes. So short file name. Right, but uh, again, how do, I, how do I send this to the, uh, to the home handler? Uh, let me change this here and change this here as well. And now if like, everything in main is fine, and I have the prefix, I have the flags, but I can't use it in home handler. So let's change this a bit uh, in Home Handler as well. First and foremost, we can create a uh, type uh, structure, let's say. And in this case, we can say something like, uh, I don't know, handlers. It's not a very uh, pretty name, but yeah, that's the best I can do right now. Uh, and we know we want to use a logger inside here which is of type uh, log logger. I want to move this one, uh, so I can remove the handler now because it's gonna be redundant, and I want to move this one on a type. So I'm gonna have h handlers. And to use a pattern that's pretty frequent in Go, like you will see functions being used as constructors. And in that case, uh, let's say we want to, to write a constructor for, uh, for handlers. Uh, you can call it new handlers. And why new and not make, for example, is that uh, if you look at the standard library, new is uh, used whenever you return a pointer, and make is returned when you return the actual type, not the pointer to the type. And that's a pattern that you'll see, for example, with the new and make functions. And if you look at other packages, they use the same naming convention for them. So you can do this, and then I have the handlers here. Uh, I said I want a dependency on uh, logger. <laughs> and I want to do a return here. Um, logger, logger, sorry. Right, so 
now I can build the, the package. Uh, oh, and that's a good point. Um, so now the package is uh, more usable. I need to build it here as well. So I can say something like, oh, give me a uh, H, which is a home page new. And I can uh, send my logger. And that's how you do dependency injection in Go. Uh, and especially when the, the request has um, so when the, the request has a dependency on, uh, on a data that's cross request boundaries, right? I can do as many requests as I want to, to log, uh, sorry, to, to the homepage, but those requests will always use the logger instance. Like they don't need a new, uh, new instance created. Uh, then I, will, uh, I, I don't need to insert that at request time because it's gonna slow down the request, right? Uh, so I want to, to have that instance always present there. And the final step that I need to do here now is just say, hey, log, logger, and print line, and that's it. Like, that's, that's the way to, to do um, dependency injection. What else uh, can we do here? Well, we've heard about middlewares in the, uh, in the previous talk, right? And we can write our own middle, middlewares quite efficiently in, in Go using the standard library as well. And you can do something like, let's say, the uh, logger uh, middleware, right? So this one accepts a uh, handle func, uh, which we've seen, right? And returns the handle func. Because that, that's, that's how Go works uh, for HTTP package. And we can, I don't want to return a null, I actually want to return a function. So um, now we can actually do some, some work here. And what I'll do is I'm gonna move this from here, right? So my request is still there. Um, let's put it actually as a method on handlers so we have access to, to our dependency, right? And then we can call, okay, I want you to call the next one for me. Um, and let's make this actually a bit more useful. Let's say we want to time the request. So start time should be time now. And change this one a bit. In how many milliseconds, let's say. Um, time now, sub and start time. Right, so that's how you can quickly instrument your uh, request. And to, sorry? Okay, I can put it in defer, sure. <laughs> so I, I can do this if I want. Okay. So yeah, there, there's plenty of ways to, to, to approach this one. Uh, another thing that, that's gonna be interesting to note is now that uh, I'm working in, the, in, in my package, right? And now I need to jump back in the main package to, to do some extra work. Plus, if I want to write tests for this, it's gonna be a bit trickier because my, uh, my roots are initialized in a, different, uh, in a different package, right? I don't, like, this package doesn't have control over where it's called, and I don't want that. Like, generally, I found that for me it's easier to, to have control over the whole package and what it does in the same place. So let's move this part as well. Um, and to do so, I usually use a pattern like this. Um, let's say uh, setup roads, and I send the mux there. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create um, the method here, right? And I can I can basically <laughs> cheat a bit on this one. And now all my uh, package logic is self-contained. I, if I want to change this one from slash to I don't know home page. Right, I can do that. And I don't need to, to jump back in main to, to change it. But I want to do logging for this. That's what we started doing. So I can do this, and that's it. That's how you do uh, middleware management for, for your app. You can use Qi, for example, which simplifies this, or like Gorilla Max, for example, which has the built-in middleware logic. But if you don't need something more complex, if you need something like a Lambda function, 
uh, running on Amazon or on GCP or Azure, then yeah, like this this would be a uh, minimal example of, of running a Lambda function without having to, to have external dependencies. Um, let's see if it actually still works, right? We've done a bunch of refactorings here and like everything uh, should still work, but let's see. So we have uh, actually, let me see if I jump back in presentation mode now. So where's my console? So now we have um, the server running. We see the, uh, the date prefix as well. We see that uh, this one actually was written on main go uh, line 27, so that's correct. So it's easy for me now looking at the log file to see what's going on there, right? And uh, if we do a request, So the request still works, and we've seen that, well, it's processed in zero seconds. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I can add the timeout there, but like, that's, that's how you do it, right? And what, in, I, I don't have the time, but probably in like 20 minutes we've, we've written a com uh, complete solution for how to, uh, to serve HTTP pages, right? Uh, the other thing is that we probably want to, to write some tests. I said production, right? So unless you do um, test, uh, what was the, uh, the saying yesterday, the TDD one, uh, test during deployment. Yeah, so unless you do test during deployment, <laughs> uh, yeah, you probably want some tests, right? So let's say uh, we use the classic uh, Home, home test uh, function, and we can, uh, how many of you have, uh, have you heard of the table tests? Okay, a few of you. So basically when, when you do a table test, right, uh, your tests look like this, and uh, you basically have a, a, a struct, a slice uh, of, of struct, where you define the name of the test, and then you define your inputs and outputs, and then you actually range through the test, and what I've done here, um, and you'll see there's a warning that, oh no, this is shadowed. This actually is an intentional shadow, uh, because if I want to run in parallel the tests, uh, this will fail without that line. It's gonna mess up the order. Uh, be, uh, if anyone saw the presentation yesterday in the same room uh, from Sean Kelly about um, uh, the message queues, he basically explained the problem there. Like, uh, due to the pointers and how they work, when you run t uh, go test dash parallel, uh, it's gonna mess up your tests. So I'm not gonna write the whole test right now because I'm too lazy. Uh, but I have the, the test predefined here. <laughs> you, you, you can understand why. <laughs> like, I'm not going to subject you to all of this. Uh, the only thing that I need to do is probably change this a bit because um, I've changed the names, right? So I have new handlers here, and I don't want to, uh, to provide a logger. And I have a, instead of handler, uh, let's call it home, right? So this one actually tests the actual handler, doesn't test the, the workflow that your request would do. Uh, and that's something for you to explore if you want on how to, like, you have all the logic here to set up the routes in order to, to be able to inject a uh, test server in it, which basically will follow the same approach. We'll, let's go for this one and uh, explain. So. Uh, we want to have an HTTP request as an input to our handler, and we want to have an HTTP response as an output. That's how it works. And uh, we have some expected uh, types, right? We expect a certain uh, status and a certain body. And um, there is a package called HTTP test. It's in standard library. It's under net HTTP, uh, HTTP test. So this one is the import, and it has some cool features in there. If you don't, if, if you don't know about it or haven't looked at, at it yet, have a look, because it, it allows you to do some interesting testing using the, uh, test, uh, the HTTP uh, interfaces. And you can create a new HTTP test request, so you, you can actually have a request created there, 
uh, with all the correct fields and so on. And in, in this case, it's going to be a simple one, right? It's going to be get me the home page, and there's nobody. So this one is a get request, not a post. And I want to have the response uh, recorded, told to me, but without using the actual uh, HTTP response that you normally get, because that's, that's an interface, and we want to know more about our response, not, not just what the interface allows us to do. Uh, if we go here, the interface that, uh, that we have in HTTP would give us the right header, uh, right, and header, which are not useful because we want to actually see what happened in the request, right? So this is where uh, HTTP test new recorder comes in and gives us a HTTP test re uh, response recorder. And we use that here, like we run our handler, so we actually call this with the input and output parameters that we expect, and then we say, okay, tell me if the uh, response code was different from what I expect, and tell me if the uh, body of the string is different or not, right? So if I run this, it's gonna fail. Or not, is it? No, it's not. So yeah, I, uh, I reference the message directly. So that, that's why it doesn't fail. But in your proper test, like you should probably write here your actual uh, test case, right? So if I would run it uh, again, it will fail, sorry. Right, so now we know it failed, and we know why it failed as well, which makes it easier for, uh, for you to, to debug it as well. So uh, that's, that's kind of it, like writing tests for, for this is a lot easier than, than it looks, and you don't need to, to write tests, as I said, for example, for initializing the HTTP server, there, there's no point in that. Um, what else can we do? We can do a de Docker deployment, so if the demo works, uh, I already have the, demo, uh, the Docker container, right? And uh, this one is using the like the latest features available in Docker, uh, one point uh, no sorry um, eighteen point three or something like that. When they introduced the multi-stage building uh, process, where it allows you to have a single Docker Docker file, and you can do uh, both the build step and the uh, actual container step at the end. And um, what I'm using is the Go one eleven. A beta container, uh, just because why not? Uh, test, testing Go, right? Uh, I'm actually also using, in case you haven't noticed, a Go mode here. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and like, yeah, that's that's how you usually do. Like, you add your dependencies. Uh, I I prefer to vendor my dependencies um, and actually commit them with the code. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be needed since Go 1.11. But f uh, I generally advise for that because it makes it easier to, to do the build step and it makes it easy to track what changes. Also, you don't need to depend on GitHub or internet to, to do your build. So um, like I just need to add a directory. Uh, this step is actually needed in order to like run without running as a, a root user inside the container. By default, your container runs as like the application inside your container runs as root, and maybe you don't want that. <laughs> it's probably not a, not a good idea. And I want to disable the Cgo part, because if I use the net package, uh, it's gonna automatically try to use the uh, system resolver, which, is re uh, like, which means interacting with a C library, but I want to like, have a pure Go build, like I don't want to depend on any libc from the system. So then I can just say, okay, disable the C go uh, part, and then run just go build as I, I do it before. And in, in the actual container, so where it says final stage, it's, it's a classic container, like you, you build it uh, based on Alpine and like copy whatever you need. In this case, I need the SSL certs and the, the build binary that we, we've got from the previous build, expose the port and that's it. So let's see if it actually works. Um, oops, wrong button. 
Right, so uh, they actually delete that. No, we won't see. <laughs> uh, I actually deleted the, uh, the configuration by mistake earlier. Uh, sorry. Okay, I can skip on this one, but you have to trust me on, on, on it. Uh, it. It depends on, uh, because my binary now depends on some environment variables, it will scream at me if I run the build pr process. So it's not that exciting <laughs> to, to run it. Um, what's interesting is that I was also using, uh, and in case you haven't noticed, uh, this is the path to my project. So I'm using the new Go uh, 111 uh, Go module feature, or Vigo, if you've heard of it. So I have actual packages. I'm not referring to them in a relative path. Like my paths are like normal packages. I should probably format this, right? Uh, so that's what Go 11 brings to us. You can <laughs> start doing this. Stop depending on Go path and build your app anywhere. And yeah, that's, that's kind of it, I guess. Uh, I'm sorry for the uh, Docker demo, uh, but as you can see, it kind of failed to start because it doesn't have permissions and so on, so like, I need to spend a couple minutes to configure it. Um, database work uh, as a last step, like inserting the database uh, would be as simple as inserting the logger now, because you would say something like, uh, let's say SQL X connect, right? So you would have your SQL connection that you get from the driver and then you just need to say, oh, I need to, to do the database part, right? So I add it as a parameter to, to my function. I add it all the way. Uh, so SQL X dot DB. I prefer SQL X because it adds a few more convenience uh, features to, to that. And then I, I want to have a uh, DB, which is a DB, right? So I actually uh, SQL DB, right? So that's how you do SQL work afterwards or anything else that you depend on. Like, I, I, if this one would actually, give me a second, where do I have the import? Uh, JMY run SQL X. So now it's going going to the internet. The question is, it's gonna is it gonna work or not? Ah, it worked. Okay, surprisingly, the internet works in a demo. Uh, yeah. And like now, you could literally start writing your uh, your query straight into it. And you have like you, in order to mock the database. You'd mock it only once and then provide it to all your handlers, for example. And because you inject it like that, you don't have to worry, oh, am I passing it to the request or not, and so on. It's going to always be on the uh, handler uh, struct. And I also advise you to use the uh, functions that have context at the end because you can do this. So you can provide them with the context from your request. Uh, let me make this a bit less uh, red. So if you if you use this type of work, like everywhere you need to connect to somewhere or like execute a query, use the context uh, from, from your request. As uh, my previous uh, colleague uh, sp spoke about, like uh, you'll be able to cancel your requests if the client cancels those. So you don't need to do extra work, right? And that's pretty powerful. And um, I've, I've seen very few packages that actually use this. But if, if you're interested in uh, saving some money eventually <laughs> or making your application more performant, knowing when the client cancels or times out or anything happens on the internet until it reaches your server and like the connection terminates, that's a very useful thing to do. Not to mention get tracing and so on. Um, I think that's it. Um, I think we are running out of time, if I'm correct. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, I if you want to talk afterwards, I can show you some, some more things. Um, yeah, just feel free to grab me around here. Yeah, so five minutes of questions, or you can get an early uh, start to, to lunch. <laughs> After you. <laughs> okay, no questions? Cool, I guess. Ah, wait. Haha, <laughs> there's. <laughs> You're using here Golan. Yes. And you're using a lot of uh, 
I don't know, um, um, uh, some packs or something like that. Can you a little bit, because it's very neat, so uh, can you share what, what kind of uh, configuration you're using for this one? I'm using the default configuration, yeah. so like it's basically, I... No, uh, because you have a lot of generation of code or... Yeah, so it comes by default with, like, I can show you uh, after a, a, a bit more if you want, but like it comes by default with a lot of built-in configuration and so on. And earlier when I said that, yeah, I kind of want to, to move it to a different package and it didn't fit on screen, it's because Windows was scaled already. But like, uh, you can do a lot of refactorings out of the box with it. So for example, if I want these two to be in their own function, I can say, oh, I, I just want this to be a function, right? So you have all, the, all these bits on the back end, uh, of hints. Yeah, so that's a plugin. Uh, and there's another plugin for, for it to actually teach you shortcuts. Like, I'm not sure, uh, how should I do it? Let me see. Uh, no, 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 I, I, I know how to do it. It's, uh, <laughs> What, what I wanted to show you was the other thing. Like if I go here, like if I don't use uh, shortcuts, there's gonna be a different plugin here which tells me, oh, you're not using shortcuts. So like it also, there, there's a different plugin which allows you to, to get help for, for the shortcuts and like teach you and so on. And you have uh, statistics for them. But yeah, uh, the, 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 other present, uh, the other plugin is called presentation plugin and allows you to, to have the shortcuts pop on, on the screen. Uh, hi there. Um, it's obviously not the case in like home page packet, but imagine a scenario that you have users package, which you all, you have an endpoint for your users. You have the yeah. user model defined there, and you have an orders package, which has an API endpoint for orders. And in order model, you act you're actually referencing to user model, right? Yes. And you can also refer to the order model from the user. Uh, and in this case, you will find yourself in a circular dependency hell. Uh, I've been wondering, like, in this kind of structuring, uh, what's the, like, workaround for that? I mean, for services, it's kind of, in a way, like, might be abstracted by using some sort of, like, interfaces, like local interfaces that do abstract it and you will inject it. But especially, like, uh, when you are doing the modeling, uh, that, that's a bit tricky to get right, and you can easily find yourself in the circular dependency situation. Right. So, um, yeah, I actually bumped into that quite frequently because it's like that desire of like using, let's say, uh, as you said, uh, the users from the order and order from the users. But if you think about it, you can also have a different package which actually combines the two of them into giving you, for example, order history. Right, or something that's related to, to those two units of work uh, without having to, to have a circular dependency. So um, if, if in this case you want to see, I don't know, let's say order history, right, you'd create a package or, or, or order histories and like combine the functionality there. So pull the data from, from your uh, two other packages in, in that package. It sounds a bit more work, but on the long run, you can still use the user package as is, you can still use the order package as is, and then you, you can combine them to do pretty much whatever you want with them, right? And the logic will always be clear because it's gonna be contained in that package. So you won't have to, to think about, oh, where did I place the a uh, function that tells me how to retrieve the order uh, list for, for a user or the other way, like or did I place a function that tells me to retrieve the users that place an order for this item. Like it's gonna be clear because it's in order history. Uh, no. yeah. I, think it, I think it requires a bit of a like mind shifting if you are coming from like a uh, classical uh, Rails C MVC background because in there you're just relying on uh, active record to give you like User dot orders and yeah, all yeah, right. Thank so you. You're welcome. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Anyone else? Any questions? I guess that's it. Thank you. <laughs>